Hey there, my name is Mark McCartney and welcome to the What is a Good Life podcast. Over the last two years, I've interviewed over 150 people around this question, not to provide a universal answer, but to provide content to inspire your own inquiry into finding your own answer. While I'm also trying to share with you what I perceive to be more genuine expressions of the human experience. On the 13th episode of the What is a Good Life podcast, I'm joined by David McQueen. David is an executive coach, a keynote speaker, and an executive and non-executive director to several businesses. In this episode, Davis takes us through the role compassion plays in his life. Compassion for himself, for others, in reconnecting with nature, in building community and contributing to others. While we also discuss anything from the supernatural to imposter syndrome, the importance of knowing when enough is enough materially, and ultimately following our own path. This conversation resonated hugely with me, and David provides a great example of someone who is consciously trying to construct their own good life. And throughout this conversation, he effortlessly drops nuggets of experience and insight that left me with a lot to ponder after this conversation, as I'm sure it will for you too. And if you enjoy this conversation, please like, share and subscribe as I greatly appreciate your support at this stage of my podcasting journey. So without further ado, the 13th episode of the What is a Good Life podcast. So David, um, thank you very much for joining me today on the What is a Good Life podcast. As I mentioned to you in our preamble beforehand, I've, I've checked out some of your content before and some of your presentations as well. And I, I really enjoy your perspectives and your approach to life. So I'm very grateful to have you here today. It's a pleasure, Mark. Thank you for having me. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Well, David, to kick things off, I'll ask you the question of, is there a question that you're trying to answer as you move through life? Yeah, why are kids so damn expensive? <laughs> 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 which seems really left field. Uh, but but in, in all seriousness, I think uh, I, I'm only saying that because my kids are now 25 and 21 and they came around on the weekend and we just bought this new place up in Aylesbury. And, you know, we've been really, me and my wife have been really particular about the way everything, and they've just come in, it's just chaos. And so we've been cleaning behind them and we're like, these guys are expensive emotionally, financially, <laughs> everything, but we wouldn't change it. We wouldn't change it for the world. But I think the, if there is a question that I'd really like to ask um, that's really in my mind is, what does it take for more of us to be more compassionate? Right. That's the one that always sits in the back of my mind, including myself. You know, what does it yeah. take for us to be more compassionate? Because there's so many things that we could solve quite easily in this world. And I know there's a lot of complex problems, but there are so many things that we could solve if we could really ask ourselves, Am I being compassionate enough to myself? And am I being compassionate to people around me? And and it and it all stays in my mind. What is it that stops us from being that compassionate? Oh God, this is this is a question that gets me too, David. Um where are you in your your personal uh journey with with this question? It used to be one that really frustrated me. But now I'm in a space where it's more a position of inquiry. So just for context, the majority of my work that I do in the main is around leadership coaching. So I get to work with a lot of senior executives and senior managers in, in large businesses, primarily. And one of the things I find is that a lot of people aren't compassionate to themselves. We beat yeah. ourselves up so much um, because of these external expectations, you know, like, this whole nonsense, okay, I'm going to say nonsense and then I'll edit afterwards in my head, right? But this yeah. whole nonsense about feeling as an imposter wherever we go, why, why why, should we feel like we're an imposter? We've done the work, we've got the receipts, we've got the experience, and then we go into these rooms and we feel that we're not worthy to be in there and we feel that we're not good enough. What does that stem from? And again, a lot of it for me is because we've just had so many experiences from childhood to now where we just haven't been compassionate enough because we're always trying to do the next thing, get the house, get the building, get the career, get the qualifications, go on the holiday, all this kind of stuff. And how much of it is just really around, okay, how is this, how am I really feeling about this? And so a big part of this, to, to, to in a roundabout way, a big part of the answer to your question is, is it used to frustrate me, but I'm calmer about it now because I believe all of us have just got to be able to tackle it and just see how we come to an answer on that. And be okay that we're going to be at a different level. Some people are just not going to be compassionate because they're absolutely afraid and the lack of compassion is what has brought them success to a certain extent. And for others, people just don't know how to be compassionate. And so I'm, I'm a lot more gracious and graceful 
around individuals not being as compassionate as I would like them to be, or I believe that we should be. Um, and I'm also a lot more gracious to myself, recognizing that I need to demand it of myself first before I demand it of other people. But that's where I'm at. Man, these are some beautiful sentiments. This, um, this idea of even grace in the face of not seeing the world, like the world not being ideally as maybe we would like it to be. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but I think you said something very important there as well, which is just a sense of we unfortunately do live in a society which seems to reward or in certain avenues of society, it rewards um, a lack of compassion and how people approach life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite it's actually quite scary. I'm, so I was thinking I was thinking the other day. So I'm I'm 53. I was born at the last I made it to the last year of the 60s. Right? And I remember <laughs> growing up in the early 70s and we didn't have the proliferation of plastic for drinks like we have now or containers. I remember we used to get fizzy pop, God, I'm showing my age here now, but getting fizzy <laughs> pop. And we used to take Fanta or the equivalent. We used to take the bottles back to the shop and we'd get 10 pence for returning a glass bottle. And and I, and I look at that and I think in the short space of maybe 20, 30 years, we have moved to a, a, a such a disposable way of living that we have literally fucked up the planet and our environment for convenience. Yeah. And so for me, the compact to your point about the, the systems being uh, uh, around, I, I, I often think of the, in my house, I've got four bins outside, you know, labeled accordingly. I can go and put one in the rubbish, some in the plastic, some in the, you know, the, the recyclable stuff. And I was taking some stuff out the other day and I realized I'm actually really privileged this is a real, you don't even think about it, but that's a huge privilege. And and I was also thinking, I'm putting this plastic container in here. They ain't getting recycled. That shit is not getting recycled, all right? Those plastic bottles are not, it sounds nice. Okay, oh, put the, you're not recycling it. That stuff is going in landfill. But where is that landfill? Who lives next door to that landfill, whether that's in the UK or whether that's, you know, in, a, in an underdeveloped country who will take on board this waste and then people will live in that space. And it, it really made me think that in a joined up way, so many choices are made out of convenience and we don't really think about compassion. I'll give you one more example. In lockdown, the we were obviously, Amazon and all the other companies, were they were on a tier. They were making so much money because no one could leave their house. Everybody's ordering stuff in. And I remember there were two things that really struck me. One was like, why have I got so much cardboard in my dustbin? I've ordered a ring and I'm getting a box like four by 10, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> With all the paper, you know, I'm putting all this cardboard in and, and, and realizing in the supply chain is definitely, Amazon was definitely getting the upper hand. I'm just using them as an example. They were getting the, some of the larger companies were getting the upper hand in terms of that material. But there was also this thing where individuals came to the door, they'd ask for my name, how old are you? I'm like, I've got all the grays in my hair, but you still want to know how old I am when you're bringing me a bottle of cognac, all right? Like, I'm not 19, mate, all right? But it's all good. But then all of a sudden, when that slipped away, those same delivery companies no longer knocked on the door with the same kind of compassion to check or leave a message. Parcels were just dropped. And I mean, we had expensive right. products where we'd go away for a weekend and it'd just be dropped on the door and and somebody would say, oh, we left the path basket. And I'm like, no, you never. You just didn't. And and I looked at it and I, and I would go like, these delivery drivers are pissing me off. And then I'd speak to someone and they go, well, they, they have targets that they've got to meet. They can't pee in the day. They can't do, they've got to rush and they've got to put this stuff down. So my displaced anger with those delivery drivers who were really compassionate in lockdown was because the system or the leaders who were managing them, they just changed the goalposts. It was just get it out there and what have you. So I'm being less compassionate with them. They're being less compassionate with me. Their managers are being less compassionate with them. And there's this whole chain of events where you realize it's not about how am I adding real value to the next human, but it becomes around how do we get this transaction done as quickly as possible? Yeah. Then we get pissed off if we do a next, we, if we've got Amazon Prime and it doesn't come within 24 hours. We're like, what the hell? I'm yeah, 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 yeah. This, a month. this is what I signed up for. You're like, you're like, what? And so to your point, there is a whole, there's a whole, it's systemic, the way that, you know, the way we treat the simple things like delivery, but then all the way up to politics and what have you, the way we just treat fellow humans, there's something that's just not, there's a bit of kindness that's missing. And so that question does play on my mind. How kind and compassionate are we? And what, and what do we do systemically to try and change that?
you know what like I, I love the fact that you're examining these things because I think it's I don't know it's so easy I, I was walking around my wife uh, walking around Berlin with my wife and Berlin's like a, a bit gritty at times and just like rubbish love, yeah, in different Berlin, in different places and all that yeah. and you know she's from Hamburg and it's it's far more pristine looking and sometimes she just comment on the rubbish and I'm like, yeah, but this is what our society looks like. And it's obviously way worse than like Berlin, like for God's sake, like you're not, what you're talking about is even ships of plastic being shipped over to Malaysia or places like this and, and then being thrown in the ocean. Like, but, but it is interesting, even when you just to see little bits of trash around the place here and you're just like, this is what we're doing. Like we've got this super convenient lifestyle where we're not like, we're not enhancing our life. I sometimes think, if our time here on the planet does come to an end, it will be so depressing when we think of that this is just for convenience. Because we're not talking about like things that dra- like drastically enhance our lives. It's just yes. that we don't. We can do things like a, a few minutes quicker. Yeah, and and yeah, and to your point, just for the price of convenience, you know, I I am as a speaker. One of the things that I did for many years was just traveled. I jump on a plane, I go to my client, I go and deliver, and then all of a sudden we had this lockdown where we couldn't go anywhere. And I'm like, why am I leaving my house when I've got really good Wi-Fi? I got my, I got my, my little, my little road microphone. Yeah, I got my cameras. I got my lighting. Why am I leaving my house and adding to the environment when I can do this? And you know, all of a sudden, everybody had to recognize that you know that there wasn't as much transport. You know, what have you? Everybody was stuck for a moment, so you had to stay with that. But then all it just takes is a moment and people it, it just switch off because people are incentivizing you. Like, we want you to fly again, business class, get your Amex points up and do your thing and da da da. go to Dubai. And, and, and I remember there were, there were a number of um, people in my network who were, they, it, it, it felt like their, I'm trying to think of a better metaphor, but it felt like their, their feet had been cut off. I'm thinking of, sorry, I'm thinking of a better metaphor, but just work with me because they couldn't travel. <laughs> They just couldn't travel to their favorite destination. And I remember they were, you know, and, and on the one hand, there's these individuals who were like, I'm never going to get a vaccine, but then you can only travel if you've got a vaccine. I don't care, I'm going to go there and I'll stay in quarantine. And and to your point, it's these little, we're selfish, right? As humans, we're selfish. Let's just, yeah. let's just deal with that. But it's the cumulative effect of that. That's really kind of like, um, you know, when we sit and reflect on it, we're kind of like, bloody hell. When we compound all our behaviors together, the impact on that is inc- incredible. Like, you know, I, I want to get, my next car I want to get is an electric car. And, and on the one hand, I feel kind of like, well, you know what, I'm going to get this car and I don't have to go to the petrol station. And, but then I kind of start thinking about, yeah, but where are they getting the stuff where they're mining for these batteries? Uh, and yeah. what does that look like? And I'm like, I can't go to London on a bike. All right? I just can't. <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, and there's this, there's this imbalance, right? There's imbalance. Yeah. But, but I do think that, and this is the point that I made earlier, I do think it's an opportunity for us to be gracious and just think about, well, what can we do better? You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really fortunate in that the, the space that we've got, it's got this beautiful garden um, and, and I've got these gardeners and we're thinking about the trees that we can plant in here. Um, you know, in the little space of time, I've like seen hedgehogs. There's a badger in my front lawn. I don't like badgers, they're dangerous as hell. But anyway, it's nice <laughs> to see them, you know. And I've seen like about, seven or eight different kinds of birds in my garden so I'm, I'm going out to go and get the bird what do you call them is it stools i can't remember what the things are but the where you can put I, them, I know, you can I know what you mean anyway. rest, but yeah to just kind of like you know and i want to get my little um garden beds god you can tell i'm in my 50s can't you but i'm gonna get my <laughs> garden bed so i can do my old kind of self-sustaining gardening and stuff because for me i don't want to just wring my hands and go woe is me what's happening What's the little bit that I can do that can add back to being a bit more compassionate about it, if that makes sense? Just giving myself some grace on that. A- absolutely. But, you know, you, you mentioned earlier something that I wanted to, to go back to as well, though, this idea of, you know, you're dealing with even through the work you're doing or the people that you're talking to and, you know, this this lack of compassion for each other. But then you you commented on the kind of the lack of compassion we have for ourselves and then even... Mm-hmm. The things that almost like we put upon ourselves, like, you know, am I worthy imposter syndrome, you know, for should I be, should I feel okay being showing up to this space? And you're kind of saying you've put in the work, you've, you've, uh, you, you've got the receipts. It, it does seem like, I, I don't know, like that we're, we're almost seeking things from outside of ourselves to, uh, to fill something 
to fill this discomfort or, or this this void that that so many people seem to to experience from yeah. from your own self like have you generally had a like a kind of a a reasonably high level of like self assurance or confidence about yourself or have you gone through your own journey with that as well yeah i'm still doing it. i'm still doing it i'm still doing it i i used to be i used to be religious many years ago i was brought up in a quite a strict um what i call protestant christian household and and one of the things I really loved about it was rich, the ritual of religion. That's the one thing I don't. I'm not a fan of dogma, but yeah. I'm a massive fan yeah. of ritual. I love the fact that you know every weekend you're going to be in a church with a group of individuals around the same age as you. You're going to be singing. You're going to be talking about the week. You're going to be reflecting on stuff. That ritual for me, I think, is priceless. If there's a one thing outside of religion that I think, if it was going to be replicated in the secular world, it's that ritual of common commonality of dining together, everybody brings the same, you know, if we're going to a space, we bring food together, that community. And um, and one of the things that happened from it was obviously the, the ritual, there was a centering, so you could pray. There was, you know, as part of a group that at least once a quarter we were fasting. Um, and, you know, the, and, and a lot of it was obviously this kind of, um, this development of self to connect with the higher power. Yeah. Now, having stepped away from religion, one of the things that I always say to individuals that I miss is that community, because w by default, where do you go to get a community of shared values that will meditate, that will ground themselves in nature, that will have that communal kind of sharing and shared values? It's very, very difficult to find it. And I've spent a lot of my time, especially in my early 40s to now to my 50s of creating community because I've missed it so much. So whether it's a group of men that we meet once a month just to have break bread together and, mm. and then we just give each other some terrible banter on Telegram. <laughs> I think we rip <laughs> each other for hell, right? But also keep each other quite correct around some of the more sensitive issues as men that we don't talk about. Or it might be the business supper clubs that I have where I invite people around or Every now and then it might be going away to these silent retreats, meditation, all that kind of stuff. So there's a sense of grounding. So it's still a constant work in progress. And that sense of self, I love to read a lot and I love to learn. Like for me, this is great. I love, I love being able to share this kind of stuff and I love being able to learn from people. Um, because, you know, one of the biggest things I found, and I was talking about this yesterday, is the older you get, the realize you realize you don't know shit. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, you yeah, yeah. You're, you're kind of, oh, no, this, you just don't know stuff. And you're just getting, every day I'm just, like, my daughters were teaching me these terms on the weekend. And I was like, what the hell? What? Where have I, where have I been? But it's just, you just realize that you, you think you know so much and there's so much you don't know. And so in terms of the constant journey, I'm always learning, like, again, in my garden, I go and I stand and I ground. We've got this massive birch tree in our garden. So we've actually, because I'm being quite bougie, we've called our house Birchwood House, right? Because that just makes me feel good <laughs> to have that on my house. But there's this lovely tree. And I'll, I'll, when we do the video podcast, I'll send you a picture of it. Um, but it's a lovely, massive birch tree. And I remember when I first came here and I walked into that, I literally just hugged the tree. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I just hugged it. And I think the estate agent was, I thought, this dude is crackers. We got the house anyway. So the, the tree knew I was going to be here, right? But I hugged the tree and 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 it just grounded me. Yeah. It grounded me. And, and although I'm not religious, I do believe that we are connected spiritually. I do believe there are vibrations and frequencies that happen in the universe that we can't explain, that we don't fully understand, that I... I think it may be poo-pooed in a scientific lab until somebody can actually prove it. But, you know, there's something. I, don't, I mean, to, to, to kind of like go off on a tangent, there is, I remember reading a number of years ago that there are networks of fungus and tree roots that exist in nature, that they have a hum and they have a rhythm and they feed into each other. Yeah. And so when we are in those spaces, we need to respect that. Because that's because nature will always win, right? <laughs> we can we do what we want, but nature will always win. And I love that sense of groundedness of taking off my shoes and standing in the garden and hugging a tree and listening to the birds. One last one, sorry, you've got me going off on one. So when I my granddad used to be a gardener, and my granddad I always see as one of the most pivotal men that ever lived in my life. He was just so soft and gentle, but very direct. 
And I used to love going into the garden, the garden with him. I, I screwed up stuff like, and he was really patient. Like, you're digging up the plants, not the weeds. He's <laughs> <laughs> a cabbage, not a weed, you know, kind of thing. But I remember every now and then when we were there, it would attract birds to the garden. And I remember when I got older, I, I used to sit in the garden and I would always reflect on my granddad and go like, I'd, you know, although I wasn't as good a gardener as him, I always loved being there. And it's really weird, Mark, because every time I was in the garden thinking of my granddad, a robin would land in the garden. Oh, no way. And every time I would think about it, and a robin would uh, land there. And again, to be honest with you, there may have been robins all the time, but that's where my brain was. Doesn't matter, on. Dave. Doesn't matter. That's it, right? <laughs> and I remember then, so when we moved, when we first moved into this house, I was in the kitchen, and in the kitchen, it's it the the side window just goes onto our neighboring fence. So there's a little thin fence. And I was standing up there. And one of our neighbors had, um, they chopped down quite a lot of the trees. And that kind of like me and my wife are like, oh my God, there's all these beautiful trees. Why have you chopped them down? I remember standing up there looking through there. And this robin landed on the fence. And it just looked at me like that. And it was chirping. And I was like, it's my granddad looking over me. Like that was my narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then we, we realized like in our garden, we've got a lot of overgrown ivy. So we're obviously trying to, and pollock the trees and just make sure it's it's done really well and i'm standing to the garden i'm saying yeah you know i love this because my granddad was a gardener and whenever i think about my granddad like a robin appears and i look up to the left and this robin lands on a branch just beside us and starts to chirp and that stuff mark oh my god when i see it again as i said it could be could be just coincidence could be me and my own biases but for me it keeps me absolutely grounded as to how connected we are in nature and what a responsibility we have to be compassionate to ourselves and to our environment around us. Oh, David, David, the whole thing was absolutely beautiful, man. Um, you know, when you said you went on a tangent, I was just like, oh, no, you just come right into my world. This is this, this is what this is what <laughs> I, I think. I this I is what it. I think of like, uh, and I, I guess just to this idea, man, of of seeing the tree taken off your shoes and hugging it like I spent some time in, in Peru before and I felt more comfortable doing things like that there. Um, in yeah. Berlin, when I do it, uh, I almost have a look around my <laughs> shoulder to see if, you know, if somebody looking at me and, and I still do it, yeah. but I, I, I must say it kind of takes away from it that my, my, <laughs> when I'm, if I'm feeling self-conscious, but yeah. there's something so <laughs> beautiful about that. Like when you were saying that the feeling of it, like the grounding of it, the connection of it. Mm. And then yeah. also just even what you were saying though about, like religion and the the void that it's left in our lives like like i was i was raised catholic and like yourself kind of stepped away from stepped away from the church but just having some place to go every sunday where people look even i don't know how genuine they all were in terms of their they're behaving like jesus or you know like you know the kind of expression there was one christian and they killed him kind of thing um you, you know like i there's still something where the baby feels to me like it's been thrown out with the bathwater. Like we haven't mm. replaced that. And and I really love this idea of the the different forms in which you're trying to build up community in your life. Like a group of men getting together to break bread, like these evening uh, dinners as well. Like and these, these, these moments of connection because I, d- I don't know, there's something that we're like I'm like I'm trying to do like even with this this podcast or groups that I set up with like I'm constantly seeking people to to talk about things that fascinate me because there doesn't seem to be like one fixed place for this this happening yeah. on, on, on such a frequent basis yeah yeah yeah. but I think we find it right yeah like, yeah and, and, yeah and, yeah because we, we we know we've missed that void like you know I've, I've got a couple of friends in my men's group who um uh this week I think they start Ramadan and um you know i've studied islam and you know i've admired again the rituals from afar not i'm not bought into the dogma part of it there's a bits of that that i find quite problematic myself but there is something around just exploring some of those conversations with them what does it look like when you do like in my head i'm like dude from sun from sunrise to sunset you're not doing no water no food yeah i I know you can survive, but I choose not to survive yeah, yeah, with that yeah. water. I leave my water in there, but it's a real sense of discipline and connection that they have with others. And and I realize, even though that's not for me, we can create those spaces. And and whilst you know, church was really good, going in and hearing music, and you know, there's still smells. I go into church, and 
I remember my godson got um um my godson got christened and I remember going in and the chalice and the, the smell of the chalice and being in being in the church and going, oh my God, that evoked some really strong memories and hearing a pipe organ and hearing choral singing, all that stuff, it, it evokes a kind of emotion. And and again, whilst I don't, in, in some respects, some of that can actually trigger some traumatic responses as well, if, we, if we've had a bad time there. But I go, rather than just, I can distance myself from that, but I can also create spaces where I play music, where I can be in a space like with with my men's group there's one of the things i love going to is there's an italian restaurant in london called bar Remo. it's my favorite restaurant it's, an, it's, it's a home family owned thing and when you're in there you can always smell them cooking new pizza and the smell of that fresh bread oh and that stuff oh that again it, it creates that emotion so i love to be able to create an environment that evokes all the different sensories your light your smell the taste the sound the 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 all that kind of stuff for me is incredibly important. So yeah, I love that. Absolutely love it. When you mentioned earlier the story of the the robin uh, appearing when thinking of your your granddad, yes. Where where to? And and just even the idea. Look, so many of what you're saying, so much of what you're saying resonates with me. I've I have friends too that uh, um that are that are Muslim and that I'm fascinated with. I'm fascinated with their continuous prayer during the day. I'm fascinated with Ramadan. Yes. I, I I still yeah. like to look at things from the Bible or, or just different uh, religious texts, just from the sake of like, what is this life about? What is like, what is it? What is it all about? And just trying to get a different sense of perspective on it. Um, yeah. So when you say this idea of, I don't know, genuinely feeling that your your granddad was appearing, can you yes. can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because I, I feel I've had similar experiences in a different yeah. thing, and I can mention it. So, so I my, there's a there's a wrestle in my mind between the skeptic and the spiritual, right? Right, <laughs> so right. There's this, there's this constant. Um, clashing between the two and and i and i i actually i love i love the idea of us having totems or symbols that remind us of connection so seeing the robin and reminding me in in of my grant i think there was some somebody sent me something actually and they were just talking. I was talking because I was saying it to a group. I have a writing group. We meet every morning from seven till eight, and we just write, and then we just feed back to each other. And they had said to me, one of them said it was like, yeah, it's like a guardian angel looking over you. And I was like, oh my god, this is quite deep. That that's 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 a lot. And so even though I, the skeptic in me will say, right, it's not my granddad, um, but the spiritual within me will say, well, this is a totem that reminds you of him and how he saw you and how he would look up, look over you, and. And so there's always going to be that tension between the two. And I'm happy with either one. I'm happy with either one. There's some days I'm just going to be like, my granddad has done his bit and he's gone. Yeah. And there are other bits where I, that's granddad. That's granddad looking at me and making sure everything's okay. And um, I, I think there's a certain beauty in, coming back to the sights and sounds I said earlier, there's a certain beauty in having a, a a mapping in our minds or in our souls of something that brings us joy, something that brings us contentment, something that what I would say almost levels out our limbic nervous system. So when a lot of the, you, you know, it's really weird as a father to think I've, you know, I've got, as I said, my daughters are 25 and 21. And I always think, God, what kind of world am I leaving them in, leaving them with? Um, but then I also think like when I was growing up, I had the threat of nuclear war over me. We had three day working weeks. We had smog. <laughs> right? We right. had all this nonsense. And 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 just trusting the universe to be able to take care of what it needs to take care of. And 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 so the the visitation of the robins and again being able to create a garden where I know I'll be able to just sit within teeming wildlife and an ecosystem. Is uh, is just a reminder of these sights and sounds and anchoring to just say, that's my reconnection. Yeah, that's my reconnection, and it brings me a lot of peace. And I like sharing the story with a lot of you know. Sometimes I say, as I say, when I share the story, with, 
I've increasingly started to share this story, not on podcasts. This is brilliant because usually I'm talking about leadership yeah, and yeah. culture. <laughs> you know what I mean? So to be able to do this is like an absolute joy. But being able to share that for me is quite powerful because there are other people that go, oh, you put your foot on the ground as well. And you yeah. or And where I live in, 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 in Buckinghamshire, I'm not too far from the Chiltern Hills, which is obviously an area of national beauty. And that just stretches from, so I'm gone now. Like I'm at, I'm London. I'm like, I've done, we had our time. I am out in the sticks now. Yeah. And, um, and there's, as I said, there's a certain beauty in just being able to really, really reconnect with nature. And, and, and one of the things that's really struck me as I'm thinking about this, when I was a youth worker, I was a youth worker for many years, youth worker educator is taking kids out of London, taking kids whose normality was only you know, four or five floors of brick, um, no grass, random trees, tarmac. You go to a school where you've got no fields. It's like this big thing and, it, you know, the gates or what have you. Uh, and, and my girls, they grew up in schools with loads of land and loads of grass and what have you. And every now and then I'll take them into London as well, just to when I was working in schools and, and they would be like, Dad, how do people cope with not having like a playing field or a sports field and what have you? And I was like, this is London. And I was saying to I was recalling to them, but I remember taking kids out. Um, so we used to go all across the country. We used to go to Aberdaran in Wales. We used to go to Pafueli. We'd go down to Cornwall. We'd go down to um, the New Forest in Hampshire. We'd go to Brecon Beacons, all these places. I'd take these kids out of London, obviously with permission, safeguarding, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember how terrified these, you know, big and brash young guys and girls who are in London or talk of the town, put them next to a cow and they shit themselves. <laughs> right? Because I'm just like, well, what? I'm going, just touch the cow. It's absolutely fine. And in their mind, they're thinking, right, it's a cow with others, but they think it's a bull. And yeah, the bull's yeah. going to grow on them. Or even kids terrified because a sheep has turned and bleated at them. And I'm like, this is really harmless. This is this, but then you realize that disconnect, right? The disconnect is they haven't been in that space. Yeah. And and I always said to myself because my wife's originally from the Midlands. Is, uh, I'm from London. My wife's from Leicester and Midlands. And I always said, eventually, as we get older, I want to make sure that I'm reconnected outside of London, but with country or rural areas. And um, and I actually think that is uh, for a lot of kids, especially who are living in very tense, um, very um, highly populated urban spaces, to be able to, um, to to use the title of your podcast, having a good life, to, to get them to be in spaces where they realize that they don't have to impress anybody and they can just reconnect with what's really good and reconnect with energies. I think it would be one of the best gifts that you could give, one of the best gifts, just take them out of that space. You, you know, when you said that... Uh... The idea that you could, that they have no need to impress anyone. Um, when you were just kind of in one of your opening sentiments, this idea of how we're, you know, we're feeling like imposters, we're, you know, why do we feel like this? And the, the thought that I had in my head was like, you're absolutely right in what you're saying. This is the, the present reality. But it's so, when somebody just lays it out, it's so unnatural. Like, why, you know, you, you're one of one, you, you know, like as a human being, there's never been anyone like you before. Um, and that's all you, that's all you are and can be like, you can be all of yourself, which is an, yeah. a, a, just a gift from, from wherever. Um, mm. but this fee, this thing that we've put upon ourselves and almost this pressure. And even just then you said there, this, you take them out of the city and almost like a space or an opening and, and just like it it's it just sounds so much more natural versus the what i felt was unnatural as you were describing it earlier yes yeah no 100% and and it, and it is you you realize like i i get on linkedin i get a lot of stick when i say to entrepreneurs who go away and work on holiday i'm like switch off the, the holiday a vacation the whole point of a vacation is to vacate it's supposed the holiday is to go away yeah and I said, I, I'm not disrespecting anybody and everybody works differently, but there is something around being able to reboot. So I, uh, I'm sure you probably saw this in my, um, on the research you did on me. I've never worked on a Saturday in my life. I don't work on Saturdays. Uh, every now and then I'll go and speak at a charitable conference or whatever. 
but I've never worked on a Saturday. And primarily it's because I grew up and we used to have Sabbaths. So the my religion that I was part of was called Seventh Day Adventists. And we used to have a Sabbath from Sunset Friday to Sunset Saturday. No work, nothing. Um, you just literally shut off. And and there was a beauty, no matter how high achieving individuals were, unless you were working in something like the emergency services, you're a doctor, a nurse, a fireman or a thing. Literally everybody in church was off on Saturday. And for me, that was powerful seeing bankers and engineers and technicians and IT and accountants and entrepreneurs who literally tools down on a Saturday. Tools down from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, absolute tools down. And so the reason why I get so driven by this is to your point, it's it's almost like we have to always be doing stuff. And the entrepreneurial dream is here, you always have to be on, you know, get up at 4 a.m. in the morning or five and drink, I don't know, coffee with butter and do seven yoga presses and hails to the moon and then go in and clear out your inbox and then we grind till 11. I'm like, all right, I'm happy for you. That's yeah. not me. That's absolutely not me. And why do I need millions of millions? It's nice to have millions, right? Because you, you can check, if you think about it, you can have an impact on the world. But why do I need that to impress you? I don't. I'm really happy with what I have. My bills are covered. I can go on holiday, a nice holiday or what have you. Um, and I can help my kids out and people in my community. I'm absolutely happy. So why is there this need that you have to have millions and billions of money that you probably ain't going to spend? Like, you know, if you're if you're worth 50 million or something like that, you know you're not spending that money because it's just that worth. And then you just want to try and get to the next person. Yeah. And, and, I, and for me, there's something perverse about that. And again, everybody to each to their own, but there's something perverse around venerating multi, multi millionaires, billionaires, who very often, and I can tell you this from conversations, who very often are very sad. Very sad and very lonely because they don't know who to trust. And, um, you know, have to create this world around them to protect that money and protect themselves. And so for me, there is something around, as I mentioned, that these Sabbaths, these taking the time out and, and just reconnecting, restarting, rebooting, whether it's young people leaving a, a major city to go to the country, whether it's entrepreneurs taking some time off, whether it's, you know, even as a, even as a, even sometimes when I've done a little bit of work in the health service, I'm like, doctors shouldn't be working a 14 hour day. Right. Doctors shouldn't be working a 14 hour day. They should be working a day where they can be on the fullness of their of being aware, you know, you imagine if you've gone into for surgery and you're hour 14 when a doctor yeah. can be holding a scalpel above your <laughs> chest. I'm like, I'm like, nah, mate, go get a drink and go and bring the other one in, please. Thank you very much. But there's so much around the way that the system is designed that is not compassionate and doesn't help us. And um, to kind of like revert back to your first question, I, I do think that there's something around a system or systems which allow us to thrive rather than survive. Yeah. And uh, I don't think we have enough of those. You know, it's it's interesting you went there because when you were describing this and even taking these teenagers out to the countryside, and I often get the impression that like a lot of us in cities and, and Berlin's a bit of an eclectic city. I've lived in London too. It's it's not the same as as London. You know, there's just not that intensity or, or that uh, there's more space here, I'd say. But still, it's a city. And I, I kind of get the feeling sometimes in cities with all the distractions that we have at our disposal, it's almost like when you see that weed growing out through the crack in the, the pavement, you know, that... That's yeah. almost like that's how nourishing a city is for us. Like we can survive here, sure, but I I just don't think we we thrive here. And yes, I I love this sentiment too, though of you know you could hustle nonstop and maybe even earn more money, but you have a pretty damn yeah. nice life. Like with your your garden at the back, with your nice holidays, supporting your family, helping out in the community. And just when you talk about this perversion of like just seeking millions after millions there is just a there's a certain pie that's there to go around and and the more that we we kind of glorify someone hogging more of the pie it's it's a strange like it's a strange imbalance that we're we're going to be creating and mm. i don't know there's so much of what you're talking about there that i think is just so helpful for people to to listen like if you have what you're if you feel enough if you give yourself enough self-compassion it sounds like if you love yourself enough 
and of course you still achieve and you know you you've your your track record is what it is in in your line of work and you've you know you'd reach a certain level of success but beyond that you're not adding to your life you know for you for you and what you value you're not adding to your life so this having a sacred day that you've carved out for yourself just it's it seems to be like a, a like a really essential cornerstone to to, to, you know, you still maintaining a sense of space or a good life for yourself. 100%. There's a beautiful book I read. The title's going to come to me. Top five regrets of the dying. Yeah. And there were two that really stood out for me in there. And one is, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And another one was something along the lines of, I wish I had the courage or something like that to live the life I wanted to live and not it to the expectations of others. And... Every time I look at that and read that, I just think, yeah, 100%. 100%. I, I, I love working, but I also love sleeping. I love eating. I love the theatre. I love, you know, me and my wife went to a concert the other day. And and I remember texting somebody about it. And there, was, there was a bit of a problem with the artist. I said it was really good. And somebody texted me back on WhatsApp and said, you know, um, I wish I could have gone to that, but I'm working. Right. And I'm like, you ain't a heart surgeon. You're not a heart surgeon. You're not that fucking important. I'm sorry. I love you. You're my mate, but you ain't that fucking important. You could have literally taken two, three hours out of your day, done that and enjoyed it instead of chasing this thing. And I have this, I have this thing that has been really guiding my life. I think it really guided my life from when, when I turned in my forties. And it, it, when I first started out in business, um, you know, I've always been of the opinion that I, I want to be, a, I want to be a voice. I want to provoke thought and I want to be challenged and I want people to challenge me. And, and I'm not going to take the, I'm not going to take the credit to this thing, but it's something that I always repeat is that when we start out, we start chasing butterflies. But for me, the true trick is to build a butterfly garden so the butterflies come to us. Yeah. And that's, I'm like, let me like even in my garden i'm thinking what are the plants that i can design so that come summer butterflies and flora and fauna and 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 birds and what have you will come to my garden and and for me it's a powerful metaphor that we instead of just trying to chase and trying to be that again like you know in finance you can be in there and you know you're you're sitting on a spreadsheet and you see all these commas and zeros and you're like bloody hell like this is insane and then the next thing is to hit that metric and get bigger and da 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 going to acquire here and do this stuff and you can get caught and pulled into that vortex so easily uh, and 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 you give so much of who you are and your time and your energy and then you sit back and you kind of like think what what was that about really you know what was that about? You could, you know, you, you drive in the car, you wear the watch, you go to the expensive restaurant, you go on the nice holiday, but in the grand scheme, what, what does that actually really mean? And, and then when you take it back and you kind of, you think about the butterfly piece, it allows you to do so much more. So 10% of my work or 10% of my time is what I call, I tithe it. So essentially I have people who I mentor, organizations that I work with, and I don't charge them anything. And I've built 90% of my business so that I can, have 10 percent that i can on on causes people and ideas that i really choose to to focus on i can do that for free i don't have to charge it and, it, and i don't worry about it it's not something that i worry about but then i remember reading something uh, a number of years ago it was a guy actually it was a religious guy i think his name was um he wrote the purpose driven life or something like that it was a big pastor in america and he was saying that he got to a he got to a point of his life where he could live on 10% of his income. Hmm. And I thought that was beautiful. At the moment, I'm doing 90% income, what have you, and then I give away 10. To be in a position to flip that and do it the other way around, where you literally can survive on 10% of what you have. So 10% of your time, energy, and effort will be going, right, I need to pay bills, I need to invest, I need to service this and what have you. And then 90% that you can choose and you can give back. Honestly, if that was a formula... Can you, and again, I know I keep on coming back to that first thing, the first question that you asked me, but can you imagine how compassionate we would be if we knew that 10% of our time, energy, and effort was covered and we didn't have to worry about anything? So 90% of our energy could be thinking about looking after ourselves and looking after others, how that would flip. Oh man, you've inspired a LinkedIn post. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> That for me, that would just oh, yeah, 
the mind boggles the mind boggles but you know um i've been reflecting on this a bit recently uh and as i said you know i've i've switched lanes um you know a few a couple of years ago still very much navigating yes. figuring out this space and so the my relationship with the idea of success is a very interesting one and you know one that's evolving yeah. and i'm getting comfortable with again and yes. but what i've noticed even before in the last year that i was working i had i had a lot of uh, fortune that allowed me to you know to head off for a year before coming to berlin and things like this and but that day that I sold a, a number, like a, a large amount of shares and something that, you know, just pure fortune again, like pure <coughs> luck that came my way. Um, yes. I, my wife was in India at the time with her friend and I bought myself a Magnum ice cream. Like, <laughs> do, do you know, like, I, I don't, I've, I've, because I don't know whether it was the introspection, the meditation, just the trying to figure out because that just because I made some money in a day, it didn't change. It didn't change anything outside of me. Do you know what I mean? Like it didn't change mm. how I felt. Even it was a nice thing that, of course, look, money is a offers a huge privilege and a freedom, and to not have to do yes. something you don't want to do. But as I've yeah, yeah. as I've looked at my life over the last few years, I could tell you if I have a notepad, if I have a lovely book to read, um, if I I've got a dog, going for a walk with my wife and dog, both of them make me laugh a lot. That would be one of the highlights mm. of my day, you know. Yeah. Like, and a cup of tea. Yeah, 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 of course, man. And um, but also even the idea if you have good relationships, like whether it's mm. a conversation with a great, like a good friend, if it's a conversation with someone you've never met before, like this, this lights me up no end, listening yeah. to your reflections here. And um, my relationship that I've invested in with my wife fills me up a lot. Like mm. These yeah. things are really like really high up on what brings me actual contentment. You know, when you were talking about earlier, this kind of mapping out in our mind for something that brings us contentment. I think yes. so much of our life that can kind of extricate ourselves from the rat race. Look, I'm, I'm not above comparing myself to others. I still want to succeed in this new space for myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you do take the time to figure out when did I actually feel a level of contentment or fulfillment in my day? It's rarely, yes. it's rarely in the moments that we're chasing things. A bit like your analogy with the the butterflies in the garden. It's it's mm. generally what is what is kind of plentiful in your life and is coming to you. And there's no need to feel this sense of scarcity or abundance because for the things that brings me re, brings me real joy and contentment in my life, they're not they're not scarce and they're not even all that predicated on how much I'm earning. Like when I was earning plenty in finance and I've, I've come down to the bottom of the valley again, trying to build myself up again, you, you know, yes, like yeah. these things are still plentiful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I love, I love that concept of the, what, what fills you. Yeah. What fills you and, and understanding, you know, when you, when you can determine, I think there was a comedian, I think it was Dave Chappelle. He was talking about, when he walked away from it, he had got this massive comedy deal and he walked away from it and he went to South Africa and they were all like, he's yeah, crazy yeah. what have you. I remember him coming back and just saying, you know, somebody said to me, know what your price is. And this was beyond my price. And, and, and knowing what, you know, again, for both of us, there's, we're, we're both privileged to the extent that because of our background, there are certain things that if we want to augment, like if I want to, if I want to augment my existing business, I've got financial skills which allow me to invest. I have financial skills which allow me to help people to raise money. I can go in and I can show people how they can put a whole accounting system in from scratch to end to doing financial reporting. That stuff gives me an opportunity that if I needed to, I can drop into and I can pick up that skill and it can and it can really help. It's not what I do. It's not what, but if I needed to, I could draw on it. And again, coming back to this point of being filled, I, I know what I can do to allow me to be filled up. But I also know the bits that will empty me, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, and so that, yeah, that point of filling, I really like that. Is like, what, what really fills you? And, you know, you're talking about walking with your with your um, wife and dog in the country. I, I'm a, I'm a, I like hiking. I like hiking alone. Right. Um, because it's, it's one of the few times where I know I am not available. And I know I'm very available, whether it's my wife, my kids, my friends, my business people, you know, I'm, I'm always quite available. But when I hike, I'm unavailable. And so I love doing that on my own. And I, I just get to be in that space and I just breathe through my whole being. 
Um, and again, to your point, I just fill back up again. I fill back up again. And that's for me. I can't serve, you know, as I was saying, I always have, you can't serve people from an empty cup. You have to be full yourself in order to be able to serve. You know, I love, uh, I love the way this kind of dovetails into then, you know, time by yourself. You even mentioned uh, earlier silent retreats and uh, now going for, and then just the replenishing effect nature has on you, then just hikes alone, time to, to fill yourself mm. back up again. And it's almost like yeah. it, you know, that's important to you. And then it's so clear that community and providing, you know, whether it's the men's yes. groups, the evening dinners, the taking, uh, taking the kids in or the teenagers into the countryside, uh, being a youth worker, yeah. having 10% of your, uh, your work being dedicated to, to initiatives that you really support. I, I just love, uh, it's not a paradox or something, but it, it's, it's a beautiful balancing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's always a work in progress. Yeah. That's what I love about it. It's it's always a work in progress. Um, it, yesterday, I was asked on a podcast about some career advice. Um, you know, somebody had said, you know, by thirty two, you should have um, figured out all the careers you're going to do, and that should be your life. I'm like, what? I'm like fifty three. I'm halfway through. Yeah. I'm still like changing. I've still got ideas that I want to play with and just you know mess mess with. And this this limitation this restriction that people put on themselves. I'm like, no, I, I, I've, I've always seen my life as an adventure. Yeah. That for me is, you know, on the, on, on the, the few, the limited time that I'm on this planet, I want it to be a great adventure. You know, when I was a kid, I'd go off on a little adventures in my head, right? I'd read in the books, you know, Enid Blyton, not the racist stuff, the other great, <laughs> the other great stuff, right? But, you know, I'll, I'll be off on one and I'm, I'm lost in these books. Isaac Asimov with the sci-fi no novels. You know, I loved a lot of Mark Twain, um, you know, and I, I would go off and, um, oh God, what's the guy? What's his name? Oh, it was um, Discworld, Terry Pratchett, Terry Pratchett. And I used to love reading those books because I would just, it would just transport me somewhere else. And I go, well, why does the adventure only have to be in my head? Why can't it be in my life? Why can't I literally go elsewhere? And I remember being like 12 and living in West London and jumping on a bus and going to East. Most of my friends were terrified. They were like, oh my God, you know where you're going? I'm like, no, it's an adventure. I really want to be able to go on an adventure. And so all this stuff for me is like, you know, when I hear you talk about going to Peru and India and what have you, for me, those are adventures. The, the world is this amazing space where we can explore. And, you know, I remember first when I first started working in corporate, seeing a lot of Australians and New Zealanders coming to the UK to work so that they could travel in Europe. So they could literally, it was on the doorstep because Australia was so vast and they were on the coast and it just wasn't the same. And I'm like, why am I doing that? Like, I'm here, I've never been to Belgium or France. Or, and that was for me. I remember, you know, going to Germany and going to Italy and going to Spain because all those things for me were important just to be able to have that adventure. And, you know, one of the recent things that I've, in the last couple of years, that I've really got excited about is art. And I always hated the world of art because I thought it was this hoity-toity, people up their own ass talking about, oh, you know, three lumps of clay on the floor. Oh, the esoteric <laughs> feeling that I get in my soul. Like, shut up, it's a matter of clay. <laughs> but then being able to experience it for myself and interpreting it for myself, there's something beautiful about art that I've really, really started to enjoy because I gave myself permission to see it through my lens rather than somebody else's lens. And again, it's an adventure, right? It's an adventure. I bought my first expensive art piece which i'm going to hang up it's a big Jimi hendrix painting a black and white one which i paid a considerable amount of money for in comparison to what i would say but yeah. i was like i'm like i'm going to athena or one of those other stationary shops i'll spend 50 quid and you're yeah. good mate but this one was more of an investment but it was beautiful because it's it evokes such a really good memory and it's something that i want to hand on to my kids as well and again for me to your point it's just that adventure isn't it it's constant adventures and constant learning and you know, having this, for me, this has been a really beautiful conversation for me to center myself for today, having this conversation with you. And I love that because I don't get this enough. Like if somebody asks me to be on a podcast, it's usually to do with, can you tell us something about leadership yeah. in your work? I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do it because I love doing that. But being able to do this, oh man, come on. I, I Respectfully to all the, and I run my own leadership podcast. If I got more requests like this, I'm like, I'm good, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good.
I'm absolutely good. Yeah. I'm good. Well, uh, so thank- I'm on the, the feeling is, is very much mutual in terms of just in, enjoying this conversation or it being replenishing or centering for me. Mm-hmm. Look, David, just because of the time we're coming up to, look, you've mentioned so many things uh, in terms of, you know, compassion for yourself, ritual, community, mm-hmm. uh, growth, learning, nature, connection, uh, giving back. Um, also returning to more of a natural state in ourselves, you know, um, yes. time to yourself, not get, and then knowing when enough is enough. Um, like, but have like also having the privilege then to support people in your community and in, mm-hmm. in uh, your family, like, you know, all of these things are important to you as well. You've been dropping so many nuggets as we, as we've gone through this conversation and even just the connection potentially with something higher than yourself, the, the, what the Robin represented with your, with your, uh, with your grandfather, just for you yeah. to, to give us kind of your, your final thoughts on, on what is a good life for you? Mm. A good life for me is being able to live life on your terms mm. and not to the demand and whims of what other people expect of you. And and, and on your terms, I mean in a, in a safe way as well. So you're making the most of your well-being and 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 looking after you. And and for me, that good life then involves sleeping well. It involves keeping fit and healthy, having really good mobility. It involves being surrounded by individuals who love you and you love them as much, whether they are friends or family or somewhere in between family, right? Yeah. Somewhere in the middle between the two. But it's it's just recognizing that we are in service of each other. And to, to come back to the original question that you asked me, it's a good life is being compassionate to yourself and then being compassionate to others and the environments around us as well. And for me, that that is a good life. That sounds uh, that sounds pretty sweet to me, and I I just love the throughout the course of this conversation the I don't know the the effortless nature in which you kind of touched on so many for everyone listening so many important components of of what you consider a good life to be in, and this is a the what you've kind of shown up with today is just like really the reason why I wanted to do this to give people an example of a I don't know what seems like. Look, we all have ups and downs in life. I'm sure <laughs> life isn't always just a linear line, yeah. right? But just, a, 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 yeah. I don't know, just in someone going through their experience and how they're approaching life, I think there's so much uh, for people to to learn from in, in what you've shared as well, David. So look, thank you so yeah. much for joining us on the What is a Good Life podcast today. I really enjoyed it, really appreciate it. And, and hopefully our paths will cross again, sir. Def- oh, our paths will cross again. I can guarantee you it will, right? It, it, we definitely will cross again. So thank you for making space. And and thank you for making it safe for me to be that open. Um, we obviously shared a lot of stuff that was quite personal to me. And there are some bits that I don't really like being in the public sphere. And and I will say as as a as to create that space for me to feel comfortable with that without worrying about what that looks like. I'm a tree hugger, right? We'll go out there now that people go, they's a tree. They's a tree hugger. He's a barefooted tree hugger. I can work with that. I can live with that. But yeah, but thank you for making that space because it, it, it gave me permission to be able to speak my truth as well. So thank you. Uh, I, just before we get into a, a, a never ending, uh, man, I, 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 I appreciate that so much. That, that's made my day as well. So um, yeah, once again, thank you very much, David. And, and yeah, I definitely look forward to being in touch again. A real pleasure. Thank you.